I get you to turn these front set of lights off so that'll pop a little more, please? Just these, these first lights in the row right there, sir. That would be great. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Now, y'all, I look better in the dark, don't I? That's the real reason I'm having those taken down. You always look better under kind of, kind of the dark or, or candlelight. Uh, Gordon Fee, a man named Gordon Fee, is a New Testament theologian that I have followed for many, many years. And I have many of his books, and I have read many, many, many of his books. I'm, I'm very respectful of his tremendous insight that he has on subjects in the New Testament. And I remember in one particular book, for whatever reason he was talking about, he and his wife, they were out traveling, so they just found a random church, and they decided to visit that service that particular morning. And he said when they went in, one thing <clears throat> that that particular church did was they had a children's sermon before the, quote, adult sermon. Uh, so as they come in, the preacher had all of the children come up. They sat on the stage and the preacher had a short, sort of five minute devotional sermon talk, whatever you want to call it for them. And that particular morning, the subject was the Holy Spirit. Well, Gordon Fee, being a New Testament theologian who deals with all kinds of very heavy topics, he kind of leaned into it because he was, he was curious on how this preacher was going to deal with sometimes a heavy topic like the Holy Spirit in regards to these children. So the preacher began to talk and he began to talk to them about the Holy Spirit. And he, he told them, he says, now the Holy Spirit is a person, but he is a spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person like Jesus, but he's very different than Jesus. The preacher went on to say, now Jesus could be seen. When he walked on the earth, the people around him could see him. They could sense him. They could, they could touch him. They, they could hear his voice. But, but the Holy Spirit, the preacher told the kids, cannot be seen. So he is like God, he is like Jesus, but, but he's very, very different. And the biggest point is he's spirit. He cannot be seen. And Gordon Fee says, there was this long, long pause. And so this six-year-old kind of blurted out, but I want the Holy Spirit to be uninvisible. <laughs> well, we can kind of relate to that little boy, can't we? I think we can understand God the Father. I mean, he's creator. He's commander. I, I think we get Jesus Christ. He was born in a manger. He walked on water. He hung on a cross. He resurrected on the third day. We can kind of sink our fingers into that. But it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is difficult for us to wrap our minds around, let alone wrap our arms around. Well, God's Word, the Bible, has a whole lot to say about the Holy Spirit and it seems like the more the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit, the more confused we become. I remember for many, many years, a big part of my young life as I was growing up, I always went to church every weekend with my dad's mom and dad, with my mom and papa. And I can still remember in that particular church, in that particular congregation, they called him the Holy Ghost. And every time the preacher preached, it was always about the Holy Ghost. And I can remember as a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, I didn't know much about this Holy Ghost and I didn't care if he was holy, but if he was a ghost, I didn't want anything to do with him. I wanted that ghost to stay away, as far away as uh, possible. But folks, i got to say, as I've grown up and as I've poured through the Scriptures, studying and writing sermons and lessons, I have to say I've become more and more fascinated. I've become more and more intrigued with the Holy Spirit. So going back to the little boy who blurted out during the children's sermon, you know, I want the Holy Spirit to be uninvisible, I, I ask myself, especially in this particular series, is how do we make the invisible visible? I think this is especially important because we live in a very visually driven society. Images, pictures get our attention. Uh, some of you all will know that the social media platform uh, Instagram 
was specifically developed to, to promote, to capitalize on this by just constantly sharing pictures. And again, I ask, how do we do something like that? How do we make the invisible visible? Is there any way for us to catch a snapshot of the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm going to say in this series, absolutely. Yes, there is a way for us to make the Holy Spirit, which is invisible, visible for us. Now, follow me. When we study the New Testament... We notice that God has given us pictures, church. God has given us images that help us to understand, that help us to see the Holy Spirit. So right off the beginning, I want to give you one big key truth that we need to understand. God has given us visible pictures of His invisible Spirit. Would y'all just read that with me please? God has given us visible pictures of His invisible Spirit. And as we study the Bible, I believe that there are four key images that, that you can find, that you can see, that helps to make the invisible spirit visible. And starting today and over the next three weeks, we're going to look at each one of these. And they're the dove, water, fire, and then the temple. So we're going to begin... Church, we're going to begin with the most recognized image of the Holy Spirit, and that is the dove. And what's fascinating is that while the dove is the most well-known image of the Holy Spirit, it's also very, very unique in that the association of the dove with the Holy Spirit only happens one time. One time and one time only in all of history. It only happens one time and even though it has happened one time, it has saturated and dominated our thinking. It is everywhere you look. I did a Google image search this week. Mark. And I know that's hard for y'all to see, especially on these screens up here. But, but on, on my computer, on my desk, I just pulled up Google. You can see up there in the search bar, I just put Holy Spirit. And then I hit images. And of course, when I took a picture, this is all that you can see. But if you scroll down, it was picture after picture after picture of guess what? A dove, which I found incredibly fascinating. It was everywhere. In fact, in Christian culture, the dove has become the go-to symbol for the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's in paintings. Uh, it is in stained glass. Uh, it's in jewelry. Uh, it's in logos. Uh, I found that in, in, in a college there. But, but why? Why, folks? We ask why. How did this dove become the dominant symbol, the dominant picture of the Holy Spirit? I think there's an answer. I think the Scripture gives us a reason why. And we're going to look this morning, this morning at the moment that the Holy Spirit was forever tied to the image of a dove. You've got your Bibles, you have a Bible app. It'll also be up on the screen. Turn to the book of Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 3 is where we are going to start. Matthew chapter 3, down to verse 16 and 17. We read here that as soon as Jesus was baptized, He went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God. Now that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit right there. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a, say it, descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love with him. God says there, I am very well pleased. Now, Matthew is not the only one to record this moment. Mark does too over in Mark chapter 1. So let's read Mark's account of this. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, He saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, 
whom I love with you, I am very well pleased. Now, there are similarities between Matthew and Mark in this story. They both specifically say that Jesus saw. You see that little three-letter word there? That Jesus saw with His own eyes the heavens opening and Jesus saw the dove descending here. Well, let's keep building on this, shall we? To add credibility to what Matthew gives us and Mark gives us, Luke also gives us his account. He says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as He was praying, we're told, heaven was open there and the Holy Spirit there in verse 22 descended on Him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Luke adds, let's not miss this, Luke adds an incredibly important detail for us. Notice us that he tells us, if you can see that highlighted there, that the Holy Spirit descended on him, that's Jesus, in, you all say the two words, in what? In bodily form. Now that means that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus physically. He manifested Himself. He shown Himself in the form of a dove. Again, this was a physical demonstration, a visible demonstration of God's Holy Spirit. Let's keep going, alright? Now, now, is there anything else, I ask? Is there anything else that would help us to better understand what's happening here. Well, yes. Yes, there is. Let's not leave the Gospel of John out. The Gospel of John gives us more information on this moment. Now, let me stop here in order for us to be clear, folks. There are two Johns. There are two Johns. It's very, very easy for us to get confused. There's John the beloved apostle. He was the one who wrote the book. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's one John. That's the beloved disciple. That's the beloved apostle. Now he's not going to tell us the full story of Jesus' baptism. All that he does is he records some words of another John. This is John the... Does anybody want to take a guess? Baptist, exactly. He records the words of John the Baptist, the one who actually did the baptizing, the one who actually baptized Jesus. So John the disciple tells us that John the Baptist, that's the John there, then John the Baptist gave this testimony. He said these words, I saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, come down from heaven as a dove and remain on Him and remain on Jesus. Notice the first two words of his statement there. He says, I saw. John literally saw the Holy Spirit. Folks, someone other than Jesus witnessed this tremendous moment. John the Baptist literally saw how the Holy Spirit manifested himself physically and visibly in the form of this dove. Now, now, we got to ask, what's going on? Why this particular image? Why do we have this at the baptism of Jesus? The the big question I asked was why a dove? Why a dove? Well, i got to say, church, that this is a mystery on the one hand because this is the only... I can't stress that enough. This is the only place in all of history where the Holy Spirit is associated with a dove. Folks, from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, it only happens right here at the baptism of Jesus. Now, the dove makes a few appearances in Scripture, but it's never directly tied to the Holy Spirit like it is here at the baptism of Jesus. So I ask the question, why here, Lord? Why now? What are you trying to teach us about the third person of the Godhead? Well, let's let's work through this together. Shall we? Lesson number one, friends. The Holy Spirit is tied to the image of a dove at the baptism of Jesus because it's marking, it's signaling a very important one-time event. It's marking, it's signaling to us that this is a very, very important one-time event. You see, church, this was the first real public appearance of Jesus. Uh, This was the kickoff 
to his public ministry. This, this was Jesus' debut, if you will. So, folks, this was an incredibly important event in the life of Jesus. He was officially starting the mission that God had planned since all the way back in Genesis 3. And it was this ministry, it was this mission that had been predicted and anxiously anticipated, folks, literally for thousands of years. And now it's getting ready to start. It's kind of like in a community, some store, some restaurants coming in, and they build up, they build up, they put newspaper advertisements for it, and you wait, and you wait, and finally you get to grand opening day. Man, that's a sight, isn't it? And that's kind of what's going on here. This is the, I'm going to use a comparison. This is the grand opening of Jesus' public ministry. This is a big deal that's going on right here. And now, church, now this was the moment, the minute that Jesus' ministry uh, starts right here. So to mark this momentous occasion... Let me stop here. Am I rubbing on this thing? Is that why it's popping, Mark? Do I need to move it? or? Okay. As long as they're fine with it. Or I'll be fine with it. I, I'll try to not talk so loud so it's not popping uh, quite so, so much here. But uh, do you all realize how hard it is for me not to talk loud? Let, let me just say <laughs> how much discipline that that takes for... For me not to talk really, really loud, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, to mark, folks, to signal, friends, this momentous occasion. I want you to think about this. Please, please kind of lean in with me. The entire Godhead, the entire Trinity is present at this moment. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all three there marking and emphasizing and signaling that this is a big deal. Amen. This is a fabulous family photo of the Trinity. You have the Son in human form as Jesus. You have the Spirit in physical form as a dove. And you have the Father whose booming voice comes down of he out of heaven and puts His mark on His Son. And friends, church, we cannot miss this moment. Here we have, think about this, right here we have the entire essence, the entire core of God on full display. The power of God splits the heavens and He speaks in love. The Son is associating himself with sinners in his baptism, even though he didn't need to be baptized, just as he associates with sinners hanging on the cross. The Holy Spirit lands on Jesus and later the Holy Spirit will indwell obedient believers. You see, lesson two. The Spirit came to empower Jesus. The Spirit came to empower Jesus. Follow me here now. Now, why did He need help, Ken? He was Jesus. Why, why did Jesus need empowering? If He's God in the flesh, why did He need the Spirit? Well, folks, we've got to remember, Jesus was fully God and fully human at the same time. The $15 word for that is called the Incarnation. Paul teaches us over in Philippians chapter 3 that Jesus willingly chose to kind of set aside His deity, set aside His Godship. Uh, he kind of shifts it in neutral, if you will. This is one of those very, very deep things, theologically speaking, that's sometimes hard for us to get our mind around. But folks, Jesus' life on earth, follow me, Jesus... Uh, his life on earth as a human in relationship to God was a model. It was a model for our relationship with God. Jesus willingly relinquished His divine power in order to become dependent upon the Holy Spirit just as we as believers are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit filled Him, anointed Him, empowered Him for His mission just like the Holy Spirit fills us, anoints us, empowers us for our mission as sons and daughters of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, church, that Jesus' mission was to redeem humanity. Now, the Old Testament name for that person was Messiah. The New Testament name for that person was 
Christ. So Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. It is the same person. Now, now follow me here. There are many, there are many Old Testament prophecies that tell how the Holy Spirit would mark the Messiah as the chosen one. I'm just picking one of them. Isaiah 11 verse 2 says the Spirit of the Lord. Well, well, guess who that is? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will rest, come upon Him. Who is Him? The Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Him. The Spirit of wisdom, and still the Holy Spirit, uh, will give Him wisdom and understanding. Uh, the Spirit will give Him counsel and might. The Spirit will give Him knowledge and fear of the Lord that we're told right there. You know, I was thinking about this verse over the past couple of weeks. Uh, how the Holy Spirit perfectly fulfilled what is being predicted there. Folks, do y'all know that Jesus is one of the most quoted teachers of all times of any religion? Uh, even people who are not Christians will acknowledge that Jesus was an incredibly wise Teacher, His words have shaped modern history more than we will ever know this side of eternity. Now, how did that happen? Well, folks, this ability, this wisdom came from the Holy Spirit empowering His teaching. You think, I don't know about this. I, I don't know about this, but, but folks, Jesus Himself, let me show you something else. Jesus Himself said, out of his own mouth, that the Holy Spirit was on him and in him and working through him. We get Jesus' very first sermon in the Gospel of Luke. It's in his hometown. He goes to the synagogue. The scroll of Isaiah is handed to him. Jesus takes the scroll and he reads from Isaiah. Luke records this for us. Luke tells us in chapter 4 verse 8, 18, Jesus is reading from Isaiah and the passage from Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery and sight for the blind uh, to set the oppressed free. Now folks, these are the first words of His very first sermon in His hometown in His home synagogue. And what does he say? He says, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is upon me. And he finishes this passage of Scripture. He reads that and he looks at the crowd out there and he says, Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now I want you all to get, Jesus was very direct about the fact that the Holy Spirit was working in him. Jesus was not ashamed to admit that the Holy Spirit was empowering him. And friends, it's not just right there in that passage I told you. Repeatedly in all four Gospels, this very truth is, is celebrated. Jesus is described as full of the Holy Spirit, empowered before miracles by the Holy Spirit. He is led by the Spirit, driven by the Spirit. He received the Spirit without measure. Think about this with me. Go all the way back to the beginning of His incarnation. When His upcoming birth is announced to the angel, uh, by the angel to Mary, the angel says that the Holy Spirit will conceive the Messiah. Go all the way forward to the end of His incarnation. It was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Folks, from His birth to His rebirth, from the beginning to the end, from the start to the finish, Jesus was saturated by the Holy Spirit. Now, now, why does this matter? Why do we go through this? Why is this important? Lesson three. <clears throat> Folks, after Jesus is resurrected from the dead, He tells His followers that He's going to give them the same empowering Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that equipped Him for His ministry. 
Ladies and gentlemen, believers, the same spirit that fell on Jesus is on offer to those who believe in Jesus' name. They confess that to be true. They repent of their sins and they're baptized for the forgiveness of sins. They have access to this same Holy Spirit. The same spirit that came upon Him is promised to us. And that spirit promises to lead us, to strengthen us, to mature us in the faith. And i got to tell you, this is not just good news. This is great news. Lesson number four. Let's keep moving. You see, little prayer, God never intended for us to follow Jesus alone in our own strength. That's why the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. That's why the Holy Spirit indwells within us. Let me ask y'all this morning, if Jesus showed dependence on the Holy Spirit, how much more should we? If Jesus showed confidence in the Holy Spirit, how much more should we? If we're going to follow Jesus, let's follow Him on His unashamed reliance on the Spirit of God. Notice quickly what the Apostle Paul prayed here. Ephesians 1, 17. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He's talking to the Ephesians there, so that you may know Him better. Well, not only that, Paul goes on there in verse 19. He says, His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly realms. So the same power, folks. I mean, you can't just say the same power. Here you got to say the same power. The same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. Paul is praying that the Ephesians would experience that. And Little Prater Church, resurrection power is available to you and me as Christians through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That same power to change us and make us like Jesus. Resurrection power to change us. Folks, the same Spirit that landed on Jesus' as baptism is the same Spirit that will come in us at ours. So then, let's start wrapping this up, shall we? <clears throat> Why dove? Why this image? I, I'll admit uh, that this is a hard question to answer, but let me share with you good folks what I'm the most convinced of. Lesson five. The dove is a symbol of creation and recreation because the Spirit came to re make the world. I need you to get this. The Spirit came to remake the world. You got it? Do this for me. Alright, if you with me, He came to remake the world. Let's build on this. This, this is fascinating. Think, think about this. You know, friends, Jews and Christians alike believe that the Holy Spirit was part of the creation of of the world. Go all the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. We read there that now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the, uh, look at this, look at these three words. Wow. And the who? Who else was there? Say it with me. And the Spirit of God. Well, who is the Spirit of God? It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask you again. Who is the Spirit of God? It is the Holy Spirit. Thank you all. Good students. He was hovering over the waters right there. Now, folks, the Spirit, listen to me, the Spirit plays a key role in bringing order out of chaos at creation. And what I find incredibly interesting is that Old Testament rabbis, these were the, the preachers and the teachers in the Jewish religion, Old Testament rabbis, even rabbis who lived during Jesus' day, they would write commentaries, they would write comments alongside the margin of their scrolls in Old Testament texts, and they would write over and over again about Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, helping to explain it to the average Jew. Now, over and over again, we have in writing 
Old Testament Jewish rabbis, Old Testament Jewish experts explaining and saying that the Spirit of God, they would say, fluttered above the face of the waters. Are you ready? Like a dove. Wow! Wow! That's pretty cool, my friends. Think about it. At creation... The Spirit hovered over the waters to make new life. The Jews pictured the Spirit's presence at creation like a dove. Now think about this. At the baptism of Jesus, the Spirit hovers over the waters to illustrate that through Jesus, the world could also have new life. Can I, can I, can I show you another story really, really quick? Hang with me, please. I know it's a little warm in here. At least it is up here. <laughs> in Genesis, there's another story. But folks, in Genesis, there's another story of chaos. There's another story of water. And there's another story with a dove. And there's recreation. Humanity had become incredibly sinful. God decides, in a sense, to baptize, to submerge the entire world in water. Noah and his family, they wait and they wait and they wait. Has God forgotten? Is He still with them? Will He save them? What's going to happen? Will they just die inside of this boat with all these animals? Well, eventually, Noah starts sending out birds. First, he sends out ravens. They don't bring back any good news. Eventually, he decides to send out a dove. And we read, when the dove returned to him in the evening, there was in its beak a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. Think about this. The dove in this story was God's given symbol of peace. That new life was about to begin. You see lesson 6. The dove descending on Jesus, folks, is a symbol that peace and new life is now possible. Anyone in Christ, Paul says, is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. When God looks at us sinners, He's not wanting to reject us, folks. He's wanting to recreate us. He's wanting to make us new. Now, how did this happen? How, how did Jesus accomplish this? Lesson 7. Folks, we can't talk about the dove without talking about the cross. Remember John the Baptist said that he saw the dove that came down and landed on Jesus? Well, right before he said that, he said this, John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of <clears throat> the world. Uh, folks, John there, John the Baptist testified that Jesus was not only full of the Spirit, He was also the sacrifice that paid the price for our sins. He took our place. He died our death. He took the wrath. His body was broken. His blood was shed. But friends, the good news doesn't stop there. At the resurrection, His followers were promised the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The Lamb takes away the sin. The dove brings the Spirit to stay. Is what we're learning here. And folks, we need both of these. We need both of these to be good news. Do we need our sin taken away? Absolutely. Do I need Jesus to associate with me? Because when judgment comes, I definitely need to associate with Him. I need my sins forgiven, but I need more than that. I need something in addition to that, friends. Sure, my sins must be forgiven, but when I'm back in neutral, if something doesn't step in, I'll revert back to my old ways. The spirit of kin, the, the, the strength of kin will not last, folks. I need a new spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. I need power. I need help. I need somebody to walk beside me. I need to be transformed from the inside out. And so, this is lesson number eight, friends. This is how God works. He doesn't just take away the bad. And I'm definitely not minimizing that. 
He also brings in the good. He doesn't just take the penalty of our sins. He also gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friends, listen to me. Salvation isn't just about forgiveness. Salvation is also about formation. Creating us in the image of Jesus Christ. And somebody's listening right now. And you know that you need to be made new, my friends. You need the Spirit of God in you. Uh, you need Him to start changing you. Oh, or maybe, maybe, friend, you are a believer, and to be candid, you've never really given the Holy Spirit a second thought. He's kind of gotten forgotten. He's kind of been pushed to the side. And, uh, you, you never realize what an important part he plays in your growth as a believer. Well, well, well friend, wherever you fall, I, I pray uh, today, over the next three weeks, that you'll kind of lean in. Friend, that you would listen close, that you would begin to see, that you begin to understand, that you would begin to experience the wonderful, invisible Spirit of God and the role that He plays in, his, in our lives. I was thinking this morning, you know, at Jesus' baptism, the Father said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And friend, don't you want God to say that of you? This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. This, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. You can make certain of that. You can do that right here today, friends. Uh, I, I think our invitation to him is victory in Jesus. We can have victory in Jesus. We can have wonderful victory in Jesus. Let's, let's stand, please. Would you stand? Let's sing that. Let's do the first and last stanza, please. I invite you to come.